Good morning. And welcome to worship at Meadowbrook Congregational Church this Reformation Sunday. I'm Pastor Joel Boyd, and I'm blessed to serve this congregation. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us this morning in person or our friends joining us online. We're glad to have you join us today. Well, friends, today we celebrate the 504th anniversary of the start of the Reformation. I could figure that out because a couple of years ago it was the 500th, so it's pretty straightforward. So we celebrate uh, that day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg, ushering us in to what would grow to become the broader Protestant movement. This would inspire the hearts of our own pilgrim ancestors in a congregational way, and has continued to focus us on God's word and the work of the Spirit in the church. Friends, as part of our worship this morning, we'll be holding a ceremony of remembrance when we give thanks to God for the blessings of the gift of the lives of those family and friends of our church who have passed to their eternal rest in the Lord. Well, you all are invited to attend my upcoming Vicinage Council and ins Installation Service. The council will be held here in the Meeting House next Sunday, November 7th at 3 p.m., and the installation service following at 5 p.m. later that day. We'll note that this Tuesday, the office will be closed on November 2nd because we are a voting precinct site, so you are encouraged to vote because your voice, all of our voices, do matter. So whether or not you voted in person or absentee, you are encouraged to do so. If you are interested in joining our tech team, uh, you may want to speak to uh, Scott Hokett or Colleen Foster. There will be a training for our tech team coming up this Saturday. So again, contact Scott or Colleen for more information about our tech team. Now next Sunday morning, we have a lot going on this day. Next Sunday morning is Consecration Sunday in all family. So that'll be the day when we return and bless our estimate of giving cards for the 2022 stewardship campaign. And our theme has been Together in Jesus. The estimate of giving cards may also be mailed or dropped off at the church or made through electronic pledging. You can find that through your weekly email. So we're asking that you return your cards or make your electronic pledges to the church by next Sunday. Well, friends, at this time, as we think about all the church and how it's meant to us over many, many years, it means uh, to us today. We think about our own local church here at Meadowbrook. So at this time, I invite Dave Milligan to come forward and share with us about his experience at the church. Dave? I approached it kind of like a school essay that organized my thoughts. My teachers would be proud. What does Meadowbrook mean to me? My quick answer is kind of made up of a bunch of cliches. It's like home, family, a tradition, a refuge. The question brought a lot of different thoughts, memories, people to mind. I had to rein in these wandering thoughts and start with the beginnings at Meadowbrook, my beginnings, and go from there. So I'm not up here blurting. Uh, random notions and ideas at you. I think after I explain a little bit, you can understand why I would answer in cliches. My wife Lori and I began attending Meadowbrook sometime after we were married. Um, I grew up in the Methodist Church, Lori and the Catholic. My home church closed some years back, and I hadn't replaced it yet. We attended different churches each weekend. Uh, we covered multiple Protestant Catholic faiths. We went to several in the area. None felt like home to us. So we came here. I don't recall the sermon, but it was entertaining. It was relevant to our lives and even referenced the movie Jaws, which amused us both. <laughs> we spoke to a few people, had some coffee and snacks, decided to come again, determine a fit. We had a similar experience with each visit. 
We've been married almost 15 years now. I'm willing to say Meadowbrook's fit. Uh, the Meadowbrook family has caught, welcomed, and entertained us plenty through the years. The congregation is definitely like a family, except that we don't argue about what to get Dad for his birthday. Colin was baptized in this church. Uh, since he could stand, he's been in a play here ever since, every year since. Colleen has kept him engaged in Sunday school, VBA, plays, parades, games, scavenger hunts, prayers, crafts, etc. Even providing activities and learning during COVID quarantine uh, via care packages to our porch. Uh, Don Gaines, he's had him raising chickens, doing scientific experiments, looking for critters out back, and keeping all the kids on their toes, while still taking time to comment on whatever tie it might be wearing. Stephanie has blown everybody away with her voice repeatedly. Mary has jogged up the aisle, laughing, grabbing hands, and hugging. I could go on and on. There are so many here that, have always, that always have an open ear to listen when we need it. A shoulder to cry on when we're dealing with grief. Uh, just a friendly face to keep us going. That's how we are. Everybody's embraced us and we've grown closer and know we can rely on these folks. Now the traditions and outreach have grown, changed over time, but quickly became something we look forward to. We've had wonderful Christmas services with candle lighting and carols. I've eaten well on every rally day, whether it was chicken day or just a potluck. We try hard not to miss the lighted parade. We've added hats and lights to our collection every year. Watching the kids look for eggs in the front yard on Easter is always fun. Don't get me going about my wife and the cookie walk leftovers. <laughs> Did I mention the awesome puppet shows? I've assisted in serving dinners, washing dishes. I've enjoyed ringing bells for Salvation Army, getting to know whomever I've partnered with a little bit better. I learned that Dave McKillop and Dave Milligan sound a lot alike, and he volunteers to do a lot. <laughs> I call Meadowbrook a refuge because it's an escape from stress and anxiety accumulated through the I can let schedules, finances, news, work weigh on me far more than I should. I have a lot to be grateful for, and I lose sight of it far too easily. I know when I come to church, I'm going to see friendly faces. Uh, people ask how I'm doing and actually care about the answer. I can talk to people about anything, maybe hear some insight, whether it's about busy schedules or family debate, debates involving resurrection and zombies. Ask me later about that. I'll hear some music and begin to forget my worries. I'll hear a piece of scripture and start thinking about how the lesson applies to my own life. I'll listen to a sermon expanding on that lesson and get me thinking more. I can pray with others, get myself focused on things that really matter. A list of upcoming events and outreach make me want to be a better person. So the cliches fit in my experience. It is a home, a family, tradition, Refuge, I thank you all for that. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for those words. And I, I think that we can all see how the church is, our, is all of us, right? And we come together, and some of us may be new. Some of us may be coming right after being married. Some of us may be coming after seeing other churches. Some of us may have been in the church many years, but the church means a lot to us all. So that's how we're really together in Jesus. Well, friends, let us now take a time to prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of our Lord.
peace be with you. Um, please rise um, in body or spirit to join me for our call to worship. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. The Lord has established his throne in heaven. Join me in our invocation. Heavenly Father, who calls your people into one blessed community, 
who teaches us the way of peace through life together, who fills us with visions of your eternal reign, as we now celebrate and remember the communion of saints. Bless us by your presence. Pour into our hearts the power of Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Time for our Sunday school moments. If all the kids want to come on down so we can all get together and have a moment. Ooh. In costume, it is Halloween. I haven't forgotten that. Just to be clear, I am not in costume. Some people might think I look scary, but this, this, this is just what it is. But I, I do think that there is a lesson in everything in life. I think if you uh, pay attention, there's a lesson like last week. After the moment with the children, I went up to Miss Colleen and I said, what's going on with the moment with the children? And she said, funny you should ask, we need somebody next week. So here I am, lesson learned, maybe not ask so many questions. Although I work at a radio station and I ask questions for a living. So I look around and I always think there's a lesson in everything we do. And uh, today, in case you hadn't heard, is the Eve of All Saints Day. Does anyone know what a saint is? I'll give you, I, I, I don't like to put people on the spot, so I'll give you a couple of definitions that I came up with. One of them is a virtuous, kind, or patient person. And I look at you and I think, you're all kind of saints today because Halloween, and you got to be patient, you're in church, and then later today you're going to go trick or treat. And so that's kind of a saint in you that you're being patient and coming to church today. And another definition is a person acknowledged as holy or virtuous and typically regarded as being in heaven after death. And today we're having a special ceremony of remembrance and we're gonna name and read the names of people, of friends and family who passed away over the past couple of years, really. We didn't get to do it last year. I don't know if you wanna talk about this either, but do you know anyone who's died? Have you lost a grandparent or a, yeah, yeah. Aw, oh, yeah. It's a pretty sad thing. And, and you know, I just wanna say it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be sad and it's okay to share your feelings because if a lot of us grown-ups have learned, if you don't, sometimes they come out in unexpected ways when you least expect it. So you're young, if you want to feel sad, or if you're confused, or of course happy and excited, which I think a lot of us are today, you can share those feelings with your mom, or your dad, or a teacher, or Pastor Joel, and if he is your dad, then you're double down. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But I just want you to know it's okay to share your feelings. And, like, you were probably really sad when you, when you lost your grandparent. But, you know, we go back and forth. We're happy and we're sad. And it's okay to share those feelings. And here's another lesson that I've learned as we talk about saints and people who aren't with us anymore. Be as nice and kind and thoughtful to the people you are still lucky enough to have in your life. And if you feel like telling them you love them, that's okay, too. 
So it's all about your feelings and feeling okay to share those feelings. So we're going to end with a quick prayer because I know you want to get on, on with this day. And uh, here's my quick prayer for you. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for Halloween and being allowed to wear our costumes to church. Very grateful for that. And thank you for all the feelings we can feel and all the people we can remember still here and remember those who are no longer with us. And most of all, thank you for the lessons, the lessons you're about to learn in class and the teachers and the listeners and, again, the lessons. So amen. Go to class. Hopefully you learned something today and have fun later tonight. Today we remember those of our membership, our families, and our dearest friends who have been called to their eternal rest in the Lord. We give thanks to God for each one and the memories they shared together and our love together. So following our brief ceremony of remembrance, the chimes will be rung in their memory, giving thanks to God for the gift of life. Let us pray. Lord God, we praise you and glorify you for the blessing of life and love shared. We pray for all the loving families and friends of those who have passed to their eternal rest in you. As we now read our list of those to be remembered. Carol, Lazarus, Schlau, Marilyn Barker, Richard Chrisafuli, Joey Jackson, Joyce Becht Baker, Marlene Stosky, Jean and Marty Lawrence, Joanne Percellio, Colin.
Tyler Petrie, Mary Cartwright, John Lewis Swipe, Robert Fair, Dr. Stuart Rankin, Richard Hoffman, Elizabeth Ann Thomas, Dominic Dunn, Gary Foster, Richard Schwartz, Betty Wallen, Gary Boyce, Larry Foster, Bill Osborne, Audrey Blackburn, John Lafayette, Virginia Zebel, Dr. Robert L. Kinchlow, Jr., Roger and Dorothy Schaefer, Georgia Jocks, Jill Strait, Raymond and Dolly Veal, Clint Straub, Jr., Jim Remington, Bob Boyd. Friends, if there are other names of loved ones you would like to add at this time, you are welcome to speak their name aloud or to raise them to the Lord in your heart. Lord God, almighty comforter of your people, we pray for those who mourn our deceased brothers and sisters. We also pray for all who mourn God's beloved children, known and unknown to us, who have been called to their rest this year. Eternal God, hope of all who trust in you. In Jesus Christ, you weep with those who mourn, even as you cry out in triumph over the grave. Free us from sin, release us from the captivity of the world, and with Lazarus, raise us from death to life, so that we may join that great crowd of your faithful people who forever sing praise to your holy name. Lord, all glory and honor are yours through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us now take a moment to raise all those prayers of our innermost heart to the Lord as we now pray in silence, hearing the toll of the bell rung both in remembrance and celebration for God's gift of life and love shared. Lord God, we give you thanks for those who have gone 
before us, whose lives have shown us your truth, and whose witness brought us and kept us in this community of faith. We trust in your never-failing love in joining our holy ones before the throne and the Lamb. Lord, into your hands we commend all, all for whom all we pray to you, Lord, trusting that your care is constant and your heart is open. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy One, all that we have comes from you. You bless our lives with companionship, with freedom, and joyful hearts. Turn us toward those in need. In the name of the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Now may the Lord God open our hearts and minds as we witness to the word in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It's no longer reading, so just settle in and listen closely. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. There were Ephrathites, from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, Both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she went out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law. And they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they went, they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, But Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
of the many challenging things which this time of pandemic has brought us. Perhaps the most painful and difficult to accept is loss. We have all experienced it in one form or another, be it the loss of togetherness, of work, school, income, safety, or the loss of life. Of course, all loss takes a toll on us. So we might wonder if it matters whether we have experienced one form of loss over another. After all, every loss impacts us. All loss leads to grief and to some sort of pain or other. And yet there's some loss that can leave us destitute falling to the depths of despair, even. And yes, folks, this is true even of people in the church, just as it is of any other faith tradition. We all feel pain when struck. In our passage from the book of Ruth, we pick up seemingly right where the previous book in the Bible left off. We often do not picture Ruth being placed so early in the Hebrew Bible, so close to the Pentateuch. Sometimes you look for it and you think, it's got to be, it's gotta be later. It's, it's way closer to the beginning. But it does appear there. In fact, immediately following the book of Judges. Of course, all of you Bible fans will recall that many years after Israel well, Israel, Israel didn't have a king until much later than this time. It wouldn't be until Saul that a king reigned in Israel. Anointed by the prophet Samuel, the young David would go on not only to defeat the giant Goliath, but to be the next king of Israel. At the end of the book of Ruth, we learn that David, was Ruth's great-grandson, thus connecting Ruth with arguably the greatest king of Israel. Yet Judges, the book of Judges, depicts a time without kings. Ruth also is set in a time of no kings. But while Judges shows us so much violence and lawlessness in response to the same. The book of Ruth shows us virtuous and honorable responses to the problems they face. And these problems were not small. When there was a famine in Judah, Elimelech went to Moab with his wife Naomi and sons Malon and Chilion. Interestingly, the name Elimelech actually means my God is king in a time when there was no king. While Malon and Chilion mean sickness and destruction. We soon learn that Naomi's husband died in Moab and that her sons married Orpah and Ruth, who were both from Moab, where they now lived for a decade. Tragically, we witness that both Malon and Chilion have died, leaving Orpah and Ruth to be widows, having already lost her husband. Naomi now loses her two sons. Hearing that conditions had changed in Judah, Naomi headed there with Orpah and Ruth. At some point along the way, Naomi's conscience kicked in, and she just told her daughters-in-law, just go back to Moab, where they could probably find another husband. It was useless to go on with her, she thought. What could she do? She couldn't have any more sons who would then grow into future husbands. It didn't even seem likely that she could remarry again anyway. It would just be herself 
a lonely, grieving widow whose children had all passed, too. Perhaps Naomi felt that the only good thing left that she could do was to release Orpah and Ruth so that maybe at least they could be happy. And haven't we felt that way, too? So down that the only thing you can attempt is to push those around you towards something happier in hopes that you might not drag them down with you. This is a bit what loss can really feel like. When we have suffered through tragedy, we're not the same on the other side. Sometimes we wish we could go back. Wouldn't it be great if things could be normal again? Other times we just go ahead anyway, stealing ourselves for the journey to where we came from, perhaps with no small amount of denial rolling around in the back of our heads. We think we can just keep doing this. No doubt we've experienced loss in our lives, both as individuals and as a group, as a church. Along with previously mentioned losses, or we might add ones which have had broader impact, like the present COVID-19 pandemic, the opioid crisis, mass shootings, or the tragic attacks of 9-11, all of which have a greater impact contributing to the pain of loss felt by millions of people, even around the world. One of the other challenging things about loss is that while we may feel a loss in the past, we can also internalize that sense of it in the future. So it's almost like you can have a lost future as well. We might think, how can I go on into that future? And yet before we too quickly dismiss our, our, ourselves, our feelings here, I believe it is important to name what's behind that question. If we were to ask ourselves fully what that question would look like, it may sound more like this. How can I go on without him? How can I go on knowing that my job is gone? It's all gone. How can I go on when I feel this way, when I feel so bad? Perhaps more important is who we ask these questions to. Are we pondering them in our, in our own mind, thinking about them? Are we asking a therapist or a loved one these questions? Or are we asking this question of God? healthy as the former ones may be. If we bring hard questions like this to God, well, then it becomes more, more like a prayer. And prayer reminds us of God. And God has heard our cries, our challenges, our pain. And he has loved us through all of them, through all our pain, suffering, and loss. Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I were even to have a husband tonight and also give birth to sons, would you therefore wait until they, grow, they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it's much more bitter for me than for you, because of the hand of the Lord has come against me. When first receiving these words, we probably think that Orpah and Ruth will just agree with Naomi and that they'll just go back to Moab. Well, but rather, they'll just go back to Israel. But they don't. Or at least one of them. And they raised their voices, and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. And she said, 
Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. There's no doubt that Orpah has grieved as much as the others. We can picture her as she kisses her mother-in-law for the last time. Tears streaming down her face. Who knows where Orpah ends up? Scripture doesn't tell us that. But we do know that she felt lost and that she departed from those who loved her and traveled a long distance home, seemingly alone. It can be easy to dismiss Orpah in this story. But maybe she represents that part of us which wants to abandon our grief, to try and to flee from it, hoping it will all just go away. But the book is named Ruth for a reason. Through all the suffering and loss that had been experienced, you might think that Ruth would have just tagged along with Orpah heading back to Moab, where she would have had familiar surroundings and perhaps be able to reconnect with family and friends or even find a new husband. Denial or not, this may have had made a lot of sense to her, but Ruth just didn't do that. Where Orpah grievingly departed, Ruth held tight, and she stayed. She gave up any other option. She passed over seeing familiar faces or finding new love back in Moab. Instead, she dug deep inside and found the strength of heart to remain, to remain by Naomi's side. Ruth's love for Naomi carried through both of their losses. It's often said that love is stronger than death. And certainly we see this of God's love for his people throughout the Bible. But what is especially interesting here and how we witness that selfless love in human beings, how we love one another through all loss. When we read the end all the way through the book of Ruth, we see that God works through Establishing a family line that stretches to David and to Jesus. And God does this even through Ruth, even though she was a Moabite and not an Israelite. God works through all kinds of experiences and backgrounds, often making connections and building upon situations or people that we might least expect to be the ones who he picks. Just as he does with love, brokenness, humility, hard-heartedness, and outright defiance, God also works through loss. Binding the hearts of those who mourn together in relationship. The prophets come to mind. Though they can also be too easily misquoted or mischaracterized, the prophets actually do not serve as messengers only of doom. A lot of picture, pictures come to mind of that pastor hitting the, <laughs> the pulpit. That's not what the, the, the prophets are all about. Rather, they painfully communicate the deep desire God has to be in relationship with his people. In essence, his love for them. Just as a parent becomes so deeply vexed by the misbehavior of their children, God longs for us to get our act together for our return. Writing of the pathos of the prophets, Hebrew scholar and activist Abraham Heschel speaks to the suffering at the crux of a prophet's empathy. Kind of why does a prophet feel this way? Right there, a mouthpiece of God's word, the prophet feels the pain. Feels the pain that God feels. Right, when God's people go astray, spurning God's love. Prophets being people themselves, well, they also feel the great distress experienced in the hearts of the people 
to whom they are called to serve. In short, the prophet's love grew loss, grew pain. But perhaps our greatest example of this comes in our relationship with Jesus. As fully human and fully divine, Jesus is placed in a wholly unique situation. While in his humanity, Jesus feels the love and bears the burden of our grief and love. In his divinity, Jesus experiences our loss for a time which is far beyond our ability to understand, arguably up through the end of time. Yet we must remember the cross. Jesus loves us so much through all our joy, our problems, and the loss we've experienced that he suffered the cross on our behalf. As followers of Jesus, we are unified by the spirit he sends, united as one body. And we are together in experiencing our losses. Aren't we? You don't experience them just by yourself. We also witness the pain and suffering of one another, praying for, comforting, advocating for, maybe even fighting for and being present to each other through all of our losses. Sometimes we do this willingly, other times with a bit of a lazy sense of obligation or of whining. I'm just as likely to do that as anybody else. We may be relatively calm, doing what we find to be our duty, we might also boil over with indignant anger, perhaps much like the prophets, with a burning commitment to love and to bless those who have been wronged in their loss. It doesn't always take much, friends. A card sent to a spouse who has made that first entry back to their home where love laughed loudest just a few moments ago. Maybe even a glass of wine on a Zoom call to a friend after they lost a job. Listening. Just listening to someone who has lost so much and who fears that only the worst lay ahead for them. The future is dim. Friends, uh, these may seem like dark pictures, and perhaps they are. But loss is real. And we all experience it. Likely, so more now, during this exhausting, drawn-out time of pandemic. And you see, though there is darkness and pain and all manner of distressing loss, we are not alone in it. We're never alone. The naming of our pain, important as it may be, pales in comparison to the love which joins us and which remains with us through it. Friends, in the scriptures, we witness countless examples of how our great God loves us through all loss. This is certainly the case that we see with the abiding sacrificial love that Ruth gives to Naomi. She gives up her whole future, all of the love that lay for her, all the opportunities to be with Ruth. Taking our cue from Ruth, may we boldly accept the call to love one another through our losses. And let us never forget the one who loved us unto death, that all things may be new. For by his great love, a love which surpasses all things, even death, the greatest loss will die. We ask for these blessings and guidance in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join in singing our sending hymn 283.
blessing is with his people. Keepers of the covenant, people of God, go and spread the good news of Christ to all the world. And may God bless you and keep you as you go in faith. Go with God. Go with peace. We love and serve in the name of Jesus. Amen.